Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Betariel Messianic Congregation. It's my prayer that this coming year will be one of what? Great spiritual growth for each one of us. Amen. A year filled with blessing and with many, many souls coming to a saving knowledge of Yeshua. We need this, right? Because he's coming so soon. You know, by the way, uh, Hebrew classes will begin on February the 2nd. I know a lot of you have asked with Michael Gabizon. Okay, it'll be on Saturday afternoon at around 1.45 here at Betariel. For those who do not know Michael, he's currently finishing his PhD, and he's also working in a new Messianic Bible that will soon be published. So we can all benefit from his expertise, actually, in Hebrew and in Aramaic. So I'm looking forward to it. I think you need to register, but we'll have a registration form next week. Uh, now, uh, there are a lot of events, right, which happened last week, which are happening these days to open up the new year. It looks again as if the world is on the brink of war. Yesterday, the U.S. forces killed the top Iranian general, right, Soleimi. Uh, this action, I will tell you, presents a dramatic escalation in, in the conflict between the U.S. and Iran. Many expect a chain of action and reprisals. The same day, yesterday, the U.S. sent over 3,000 soldiers in the area, and it's hard to predict now what's going to happen. And as a result, the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guards vowed to revenge, on, revenge that is on the U.S., and guess who? On Israel. Why not, right? Today, in fact, they threatened to wipe out Tel Aviv. Okay? And while uh, not advertised, there's an ongoing war, by the way, between Iran and Israel. Just like Sunday, Israel sent missiles targeting Iranian forces near Damascus. I don't know if you heard of these things. And according to a newspaper in Israel, Israel Hayom, in 2017 and 18 alone, Israel carried out more than a thousand different actions against the Iranian in the northern sector. Right? Some of these actions were military in nature, others were economic, diplomatic, and legal with zero success in persuading the Iranians to stop pursuing their endeavor. They are set to destroy Israel, right? L look at this map. Who who's fighting against who? That's Iran, and I'll give you some time to find Israel there. Right? <laughs> so Russia, by the way, is there too. And just last week, I don't know if you heard this, right? It said that, that it has now a new hyper, hypersonic nuclear weapons which can travel 27 times the speed of sound and zigzag through the atmosphere en route to target, making it almost impossible to intercept. And listen to this. It could carry a nuclear weapon of up to two megatrons. Just one megatron bomb is 80 times larger than the bomb detonated over Hiroshima which killed about 125,000 people. What should we say? Hooray, yes, for, for men's ingenuity. It looks like the war of Gog and Magor cannot wait anymore, but it's going to be in God's timing. In God's timing. This is why I'm, I'm not afraid of these things, right? We will learn today through Zachariah that God has a very watchful eye over the, nation of the nations of the world. And knowing this gives the believer so much comfort. So much comfort. Also, you know, we have to talk about anti-Semitism anti -Semitism that has now become a global problem. It's set in. It's there. It's there. In the U.S., we probably have heard the news of this anti-Semitic attack on, the night, on one night of Hanukkah in a Hasidic rabbi's home in New York suburb. A person forced himself in with a machete, and five people were taken to the hospital. This, I want to tell you, is not an isolated incident, it's an ongoing, this is, by the way, at that time, was the eighth attack in eight days, one every day, one every day. On December the 23rd, an elderly man assaulted by a man using anti-Semitic slurs, another man and children assaulted in residential building, and it was, and every day went on until the 28th of December. All these things are signs of the end, rumors of wars, just like Jesus says, which, and again, tells us that the way our world is today, it cannot last long forever, right? And praise God that he's restraining evil at this time. And these things are so timely. So timely as we're beginning a study of a new book of the Bible, Zachariah, which has so much to say about the events in the world and the events in the Middle East. Let's open up our scriptures to Zachariah. 
a time travel scroll which will bring us through many visions and revelation where we will see how God is observing, noticing, and noting the actions of man and carefully regulating the flow of history and preparing for his glorious coming. In this book, the present, the, the, the past, and the future are, are often intertwined within the same scene, within the same verse. Time in all its forms is frequently reduced to a moment so that we can see the beginning and the end where regardless of the problem or the size of the giants, our Lord is always sovereign and his word perpetually prevailing. As for the future events in Zachariah, they, you know, I want to tell you, they so strangely look our, like our current situations and problems, especially in Israel. We will often have this feeling that the prophet wrote this book for us today, now. In fact, what wonders, how could anyone grasp the message before and as close as 75 years ago? For Israel's struggle, its fight for Jerusalem and for the Temple Mount and her survival are strikingly contemporary. One medieval rabbi, Rashi, who attempted to find meaning in this book, conceded and said that the prophetic visions are so esoteric that many will not be fully understood until the coming of Elijah, the prophet, which will bring the messianic times. Elijah is indeed at the door. For every prophecy and today's event concurs to the great tribulation and with all other prophecies of the end. Whoop, I'm back. Especially those of the book of Revelation, as if the veil, right, the veil is slowly lifting up. I want to tell you we've never been so close as we are today to the second coming of Jesus. Never. And for the believer, the believers today, reading and understanding Zachariah will, will, will give us so much comfort. For the believer reading this book, there will be a mounting excitement, for we know and understand that before these events, we will be raptured. A moment that is more imminent than it was ever before in history. The book of Zechariah itself brings us to a most difficult time in the history of Israel. The 70-year captivity in Babylon has ended. The Israelites found themselves under the Persian Empire and were given permission at that time to return to the land. But life in the Persian Empire actually was relatively very good and comfortable. And in fact, it is only recently, did you know that it was only recently that the majority of those Jews who were there came back to the land? 2,500 years later, in between the year 1948 and 1970s, they came back to the land. Those at the time who allowed the Spirit to move their hearts returned to the land among whom Zachariah and these had to confront so many obstacles, even with the support of the Persian Empire. You know why the reason they had to come back at that time? The reason is that they had to prepare Jerusalem and the temple for the first coming of Jesus Christ. Anything pertaining to the Messiah, anything pertaining with Jesus was, and it always was, carefully followed by a great opposition from the evil spiritual forces. They were there in Jerusalem moving everything and every neighbor so to disturb and attempt to stop the preparation of the land for the coming of Yeshua. And this is where the book opens up for us. For the situation today in Israel is very similar as for the Jews that were there. They are back today in the land, very, very few in number in fact, for the same reasons to prepare Jerusalem and the temple for the second coming of Jesus. The writings of Zachariah, then, I want to tell you, are very contemporary as we're going to look into all these visions which speak to us today. And there's another side of prophecy that is powerfully brought in this book. The messianic prophecies. And the Messiah himself. himself. For we will see and perhaps be surprised that he himself appears even in the first vision. Concerning the prophecy, Zachariah speaks of both comings, the first and second coming. No one in the Jewish community will be astonished anymore if they read the book of Zachariah. He is the one who tells us that the Messiah will come on the back of a donkey, as Yeshua did at the triumphal entry. 
He is the one who tells us that they sold the Messiah for 30 pieces of silver. The price paid to Judas is carried by the religious leaders. He is the one who tells us that when he comes back, the Jewish people and the world will recognize that they have pierced him. Pierced, a piercing reserve for false prophets in the scriptures. And this is what they say he is today. He's a false prophet. The Messiah of Israel is considered as a false prophet. He is the one who speaks of the Messiah as a branch. Tzemach, which is not a branch. It's a bud, spring, you know, a, a little thing that you can step on in this regard. As Jesus was and is today. Zacharias' prophecies are so powerful that the New Testament directly quotes or alludes to this book over 40 times. 40 times. And it is with these prophets where we will learn about the power of prophecy. We need this today because this subject is not being taught less and less everywhere. Both end time and messianic prophecies. While the people then okay, had so many problems, so many enemies, yet God through Zachariah barely mentions their current issues. But instead, he brings them right to the future and gives them a global perspective and at, at the same time speaks of the great time that is coming when he's going to establish his kingdom. See, I want to tell you, see that the, uh, our problems can be better dealt with if we have a divinely inspired outlook of the future. This is what the Bible does. This is what prophecy does. This is a therapeutic might of prophecies. This is why I believe that at least one quarter of the whole Bible is composed of prophecies. It constantly reminds us of this great other world where we're going. That is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, in a word, is the word hope. It gives us hope day after day. For at the end, the word of God assures us of a much better life. Now let's get hold of these promises, right? Let's begin by reading the first verse, which situates us in history and which contains a message of hope right there and then. Zechariah 1.1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying... You know, reading the first verse, we understand that Israel has lost its jurisdiction over the Temple Mount, over the place where the temple was to be rebuilt. See on whose reign the date is based on, on a foreign king, Darius, who began his reign in 521 BC. Usually dates are given according to a king of Judah or a king of Israel. Not this time. Something happened in history. What? This is an indication and reminder that the times of the Gentiles had already begun. This term was given by Jesus himself in Luke 21, 24, where he says, And they shall fall by the age of the sword and be laid away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles and the, the times of the Gentiles is this period of time where Israel does not have jurisdiction over the Temple Mount. Since 586, it lost this, this privilege. You know, at the time of Zechariah, it was under the Persian rule. Then the Greeks, then the Romans, and today the Temple Mount belongs or it is under the jurisdiction of the Jordanians. You see the golden top? And the mosque next to it, right? This is a constant reminder that we're in the times of the Gentiles. They're not supposed to be there. And so the book is dated according to a foreign idolatrous king. But it matters really not, for God is in control, and even today. Even today. H have you thought about the, the great irony of our current calendar? And our ways to date, you know, our days and months? It's based on a Jewish king. On Jesus Christ. The king of kings. Our dating system is supposed to be based on the year the Messiah was born 20, 20 years ago. So Darius or the golden cup, it is only a show for God is in control. God is in control. And there's a great promise for Israel. And for all those who approach the book of Zechariah or any part of the scriptures, the message of hope 
is in the words, Zachariah, the son of Berishia, the son of Ido. Where is it? Zachariah is composed of two words, Zakar and Yah, a diminutive name of Jehovah. And together it means God remembers. Berechia is composed of two words, Barach means to bless, and Yah means God. That means God blesses. And Ido, a word that has to do with the concept of time, for the word Ada, which speaks of perpetuity, without end, to all eternity. The, the three names together tells us that God remembers and God will bless at his appointed time. And this is what he does in Zachariah. And so he's about to do in the rest of the book, despite the great opposition that we had then and that we have today. And furthermore, the way the name of God is written, uh, with the first, you know, it's only the first letter of his full name, yud heh vav He is the Yud and the He. The rabbi asked, why half of his name? Perhaps because he is not yet recognized by the nation, but yet he is sustaining it, sustaining it. See that the letter Yud is the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Ten is the number of divine perfection. And the He is the fifth letter. Five is the number of grace. Together we have God acting in his perfect time out of grace to bring about the coming of his son. Even his name here begs all people to, to ask, to inquire, why is it like this? And furthermore, the mention of these three names reminds us and enhance the priestly lineage of Zachariah. He was a priest, and that's significant. Berachiah is the father of Zachariah, and Ido, his grandfather, and Ido is his grandfather, and later in Nehemiah 12, he identifies Zachariah as the head of the priestly house of Ido, which was one of the 24 courses of priests, as the one of Abijah, from where the other Zachariah comes in the Gospels. And this information helps us to appreciate Zachariah's message and put it in line with Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who also were priests. Like Jeremiah, who is called the high priest before him, who prophesied about the destruction of the temple in 586 BC. Like Ezekiel before him, the priest prophet who prophesied about the messianic temple. And Zachariah, the priest, here speaks about the construction of the second temple, the third temple and the final temple in Israel here. So these three prophets are priest kings, and the three of them are related in the history of the temple from its destruction for, with Jeremiah, to its rebuilding with Zechariah, to the millennial temple with Ezekiel. And there's one more element in this first verse which will bring us to further appreciate God's message. It begins when? In the eighth month. The religious calendar ends on the seventh month. And it ends with the Feast of Tabernacles, which symbolizes the messianic times, the millennium where the people recalled Ezekiel's prophecies of the messianic temple and a time of peace and harmony when the Messiah will be on earth. However, here they were in Israel after celebrating this feast. They were in Israel in Jerusalem with a partially built temple right after Sukkot. It must have been a downer. But here Zachariah comes at a most appropriate time, the eighth month, and begins his prophecy speak of the importance of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple. And we can say, Zachariah, the son of Berechiah, and the son of Ido again. God will always remember and bless at the very appropriate time to everyone. Amen? This is how powerfully the first verse of Zachariah tells us. It is now that we're coming to a very hopeful and promising section. We're not in the visions yet. These are a preparation for the visions. Here the words which are timeless and yet speak so loudly to Israel today and to every soul everywhere. Let's see verses 2 to 6. Let's read them. And see how Zachariah begins and ends his first message. And there's, I want to tell you, a lot for us there. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear or heed me, 
says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servant, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and says, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Let us try to see the depth of this message because it is for us today. It is for us. The first word, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Can't you see this all around? The people at the time of Zachariah just came back from captivity and the effect of God's anger was all around them. The city was in ruin, the temple as well, and the neighbors all around Israel were full of incomprehensible hatred. But don't we see the same thing today? Now? The Jews are back to the land of Israel, but this is not the way it's supposed to be. There's no peace, but constant opposition and hatred and the land. Did you see how, how small it is? How broken up it is? This is because the Lord has been very angry with your fathers, he says, because they did not abide by the word of God. And the word angry is repeated twice in Hebrew. Katsef, katsaf. For sin brings about the anger of God. For all people on this earth, Israel should know from their own history, which testifies that sin brings this utter anger. That only recognition of sin and repentance brings God's peace. Daniel knew about it. He knew after the 70 year captivity, you know what he did? For a long time in chapter 9, he confessed the sins of Israel. On and on. Things are, are happen for a reason. Okay, their current situation is because sin which angers God. Someone said how patient of history to keep repeating itself when practically nobody listens. But let us listen to what Zachariah says. And now hear what God says to Israel, even today, and by extension to every believer who has gone astray. astray. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Return to me. Have you noticed how many times he says this? Four times. Between verses 2 to 6. And this is God's desire for everyone. And see that while the Israelites did not return to the land, or actually they did return to the land physically, their hearts were still in Persia. God wants genuine action, one that has to, to return spiritually, psychologically, completely. Then God himself will return to us. He is there always waiting for a decision to react and revert back, Right? He will not force anyone. We need to do the first step. He's waiting. Today, there's a term used when a Jew returns to the land. Tshuva. Tshuva, this is. And they are, and I believe more and more Jews that are returning to the land today because of the increase of anti-Semitism around the world. But Zachariah tells them, Tshuva is from your heart first. Your heart. Now, how serious is God when he speaks this way? Have you noticed how many times he says the Lord of hosts? Three times. Three times. He does not want us to miss this opportunity to return to him. The Lord of Tzavuot, that is the Lord of the armies of heaven, that is, this is how he depict, he's depicted as a warrior ready to judge. You don't want to meet him this way, right? As we said before. And this title is repeated, you know how many times in the book of Zechariah? 53 times. That is about one quarter of all the mention of this great name in the Hebrew Bible. It's concentrated on this small book because the message is powerful. We remember that the first mention of this name was in 1 Samuel, in relation to the fallen tabernacle and religious condition of Israel. It is the same at the time of Zechariah, and the very same today when we consider the state of religion in Israel and elsewhere. And see the precious advice from God himself to Israel and to all people. Verse 4. Don't be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached. Who today in Israel and in the churches know what the prophets preached? There is such a wealth of information in the prophets. This is where God pours out his heart to the people. So we can better get to know him. And what do the prophets say? 
See the rest of the verse. Thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your what? Evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not heed to the word of God. Turn now from your evil ways and evil deeds. It all begins with the individual with an inner cleansing, which then is reflected in the deeds. The word, ways, derech, which is a course of life, a journey, a walk. This is what needs to be changed. This is when the Lord asks the people two questions. I love these questions. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Where are your fathers? They knew the answer to this question because their current state was because their fathers did not heed the words of the prophets who warned them about the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, and they did not repent. And the prophets, do they live forever? This may have been a way to tell the people that God will not be available forever. The prophets do not live forever, but our response to their words will forever determine our lot, right? Our present condition and our future condition. Once their offers are refused, there may not be any turning back. God's patience is lasting, but I want to tell you, it's not everlasting. Okay? This is the message here. This is why he's telling them, them, I believe. And these last words contain a weightier message for Israel and for all people. Zachariah and his two contemporary, Haggai and Malachi, were the last prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures. Right? They closed the prophetic ministry of Israel. And the question is, have you heard their message? While they're gone, their words are still with us. And this is the argument of the next verse. Look what God says. She had surely my word, my statutes, which are commanded my servant, the prophets. Did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, and so has dealt with us. My words and my statutes, right? This is what Israel needs to return to, God's word. These were true for the fathers as they are true for us today. So do not let them overtake anyone because even today, even the events today are prophesied. They were prophesied. This is such, I want to tell you, a powerful introduction to the prophecies of Zechariah. And so the words are all those contained in the Tanakh, that is the Hebrew scriptures, and the statutes are these things that God decreed and cannot be changed. They're found also in the Tanakh. And there God promises that he does nothing, remember? In Amos, he does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his prophets, his servants, the prophets. There are 16 writing prophets, which still speak today. However, modern rabbinical Judaism, and modern Christianities have forgotten about them. But they still prophesy. Do you have a Tanakh at home? Do, do, do you read the word of God and allow God to speak to you and to give you that freedom? Now, after these words, something really great is happening in Zachariah. Let, let's enjoy it because... It's, you know, it doesn't happen very often. The people repented. They confessed, they were blessed, and they continued the work and got the temple ready for Jesus. Right? Isn't that nice? See, see the, the rest of verse 6. Then it says they repented. Then they repented. Right? And said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. This marked the beginning of a new journey. Confession and obedience to God does always mark the beginning of a new journey. Always. Always. Notice the genuineness of their repentance. They did not say uh, that they were acting according to the ways of their fathers or it was their father's problems. But they said, according to our ways. And according to our deeds, right? They did not accuse anyone else, which is at the core of genuine repentance. But they understood the message. And they knew it was their action which brought them where they are. Their repentance is, I believe, reflected in the writings of the times. 
We, we can see them in the Targums, the translation of the Hebrew scriptures, which some believe have begun to be written at that time. The Targums are Bible translation into Aramaic because what the people understood, because they forgot their Hebrews. You know, they went to, to, to Babylon. Let, let me read you how some of these scribes translated some of the verse we just read. And see that I believe they fully understood what God said. Let's not forget that these things were written before the rise of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, before the coming of Jesus. For instance, to translate verse 3, it says, Thus says the Lord, the Targum says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to my service, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return by my what? Memra. To do good for you, says the Lord of hosts. The word Memra is the word Aramaic for the word itself, the word of God. They understood God saying, come to me through my Bible, and I will bless you. Later in the book, the Memra, the word of God is alive and powerful, and it is personified. Speaking of the establishment of, the, of Jerusalem in the millennium, the Targum says in 2.9, And my Memra, my word of God, will be to her, says the Lord, like a wall of fire and circling around her. This is why what the word of God does. This is what it does to the believer when they live by the word of God. They are fully protected. Later, the memory is used as a synonym of the spirit of God. Imagine. It says, not by might or by strength, but by memory, says the Lord of hosts. This is what they wrote. No wonder Jesus in the gospel so often brought them back to the roots, the word of God, because at that time they had turned away from it. They couldn't recognize the word made flesh. They knew like the writer of the book of Hebrews, which says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Amen. Amen. See the importance of the word in our Bibles? You know, I love to see a worn-out Bible. I don't know if you've seen this. I've seen this last time, actually. One that is falling apart. One Bible that is falling apart because it probably belongs to someone who isn't falling apart. They say what it is. It shows that, that it is used over and over, and it contains all the promises you need to have to continue your journey here on earth. You know, centuries follow, you know, and there it stands. Empires rise and fall, they're forgotten, the Bible stands. Atheists actually railed against it. I don't know if you notice, every Christmas and Resurrection Day, it's still there. Have you heard of uh, Vido Nati? Okay, he was a student in Barcelona, Spain who was working on a thesis for his doctora, doctorate's uh, thesis. So in the course of his uh, research, he spent much time, or he spent much time at the university library, and once he fell into the writing of, of uh, Hero, Hero, an obscure philosopher in the 18th century whose writings had been generally neglected. After he unearthed the dusty volume uh, by that author, he uh, lived through it and came across a document written by the author in 1741. It turned out to be his will. And it gave all the, his earthly goods to the first man who would study his book. The Spanish court actually declared it was legal. Okay? And Vito Nati collected nearly one quarter of a million dollars from the author's estate. So it is with the Bible. I want to tell you, except that there are enough riches in there for everyone who opens up its pages and riches which last forever, forever. The scripture says, blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, who has blessed us in every, not some, in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in the Messiah. God is ready to bless he is ready to bless us in every spiritual blessing that we can imagine, and he's ready to do so right now, right now. Now, how do, how do we get these things, by the way? How do we get this? You know that James, okay, drew from Zachariah when he wrote in his book, draw, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You remember that? And as a pastor, James gives us more information how to do that today. Let me just quote you the, the full verse in James chapter 4, verses 7, 8. It says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. He said the same words. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. 
and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Only a pastor like James can say that, right? What, what is the first step? First step. Submit to God. Submit to God. Takes discipline. Submit. This is a military term which means to align oneself with, uh, under authority. This is what it means. The word to submit here in Greek, it's hypotasso. It is composed of two words. Hippo, that is under, and tasso, that is to, to subject oneself, to submit voluntarily. God will never force you to get the blessings. Imagine an army where every soldier did what they want. I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like this, right? They say that military discipline makes the difference between a mob and an army, right? We are not a mob. We are the body of the resurrected Messiah. We need to follow the rules. While these this, this discipline and submissions, you know, two things are required for the person. They have to have what? Clean hands and a purified heart. It doesn't come like this, right? Cleanse your hand and purify your heart. Here James uses the temple imagery where the priests who were often washing themselves while serving God and before actually approaching the presence of God. Okay, remember the lovers? They were outside. This is finally where we come to the first of the eight visions of Zachariah that he experienced in the first six chapter, and which he had, by the way, in all in one night. And I'm sure after that he went to sleep for a long time. These visions are apocalyptic, that is pertaining to the end of the world. Apocalypse means to uncover, to bring to light. And so Zacharias throws much light in our present world's events and near future ones as well. Many have deemed these prophecies as obscure, gloomy, and hard to understand. However, while they are not always easy to testify, we, we go from the principle that the Bible interprets itself. There are many symbols and allegories, but we find them elsewhere in the scriptures. And when we compare them, it makes sense. And as Peter said, and this is so important, 2 Peter 1.20, because this started at that time already. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scriptures is of any interpretation. I wish many will understand this, for the Bible is not a matter of personal interpretation or, or personal understanding. Many judge the Bible by their understanding. The Bible interprets itself. Any conclusion should be supported by a coherent gathering of passages. This is a scientific method, by the way, which requires one to follow a process leading to the same reasonable conclusions, even if one doesn't agree. However, there are parts we may not understand now, and we'll leave them as they are. We should not force any interpretations. Perhaps, therefore, the 144,000 or those believers in the tribulation. And by the way, this is starting with verse 8. This is where the fun begins. Because we're going to meet a lot of angels. A lot. You know, the prophecies were given through a conversation uh, between Zachariah and one particular interpreting angel who follows him everywhere. And, and the prophet, I want to tell you, he, he's so comfortable up there. Okay? He feels at home. Okay? Do you know that 10 times... He asks questions concerning this and this, and what is this, what is that, you know. He's not shy, right? And he seems to have the time of his life, and we're going up there with him, and we're going to see what is happening there. It's like taking a trip, right, to heaven at this point. Actually, they were on earth, but into his visions. And all this is like a preview of our eternal home. There, you know that the same angels are going to be there with us, and we'll feel comfortable with them. After all, they are good angels who minister to the saints, let us now consider the first vision. It begins in the same way the book does. Verse 7. Okay, And we'll try to figure out why. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zachariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. There's a repetition as if to emphasize a new beginning. And why at this time? Why? Probably because it comes right after the repentance of the people in the previous verse. For after repentance, there's revelation. No repentance, forget it. Forget it. It is as if the, the life of all believers, it is the same. Holding on to a sin will prevent spiritual growth. You won't have any more revelations. 
David understood that in Psalm 32. He said, when I kept silent about my sins, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. Sin will prevent the outpouring of blessing until, as David, in verse 5, he says, now I acknowledge my sins. And finally, he says in verse 7, you are my hiding place. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. It doesn't come just like that. And so in Zachariah, there's a confession, and then there's a revelation. Then there's a revelation. In the text, this happened on the 24th day, for it seems that this is when they usually gather as a community to receive the words of God and to worship. Haggai spoke on the 24th, on the 6th and 9th month. It was on the 24th that Ezra gathered the people to hear the word of God, which brought them to worship and to confess the Lord in Nehemiah 9.3. And the name of the month is given here, which is unusual, by the way, Sebath. It's only found here. Okay? This month of Shabbat has become the new year of the trees okay, in, actually in Judaism. They said in the Targum of Jerusalem on Exodus that during this month, the trees grow higher, open up their mouth, and with their leaves praise the living God. Perhaps they were inspired by the great vision of deliverance giving, given in the book of Zechariah, which comes right after the confession. Sabbath is the 11th month, and there's one more significance we can see in the 11th month, searching the scriptures. The last and only time we read of the 11th month is in Deuteronomy, right at the moment where all the giants were killed. Siho, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, which marked the moment Israel was about to take hold of the land. And it was the 40th year in the 11th month. And so it is as if it's a new era for those who listen to the word of God. Furthermore, the word Sheba in Hebrew is the word is for the tribes, tribes, perhaps because the revelation are for the tribes of Israel. And so this month is symbolic of a new era opening up to them. And so it was with Zachariah. This is then is how the book of Zachariah opens up to us. We're almost out of time, but I don't want to leave the text without at least reading part of the first vision because there's something there I want you to take home. Let's read verses 8 to 12. Or just listen, see what it says. And I saw by night, and behold, an individual riding on a red horse, and it stood among the middle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Verse 9, then I said, my Lord, where are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the individual who stood among the middle tree answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and throw through the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord. Oh, hold on a minute. Did you see this? So the answer, the angel of the Lord who stood among the middle trees and said, we have walked to and through throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Let me give you a head start here that will help you to consider the importance of this book. The first individual we see is in verse 8. This is Yeshua himself, riding on a red horse. The same individual is described in verse 11 as the angel of the Lord. This is the messenger of his presence. Again, Jesus is not an angel, and as we understand the term today. In the Bible, this term first and foremost describes the function of an individual because we ourselves are called angels. And when it comes to the angel of the Lord, his presence is as the presence of God himself. For people worshipped him. And what is startling is that the Talmud and many medieval rabbis spoke of this individual as being God himself. Did you know that? They could have spoken of him as the Messiah. It would have been easier for them. But they went all the way and said, this is the Lord of hosts. Let me quote to you Sanhedrin 98a of the Babylonian Talmud. One asks, what is the meaning of the verse of scriptures? And I saw by night and behold an individual riding upon a red horse and he stood among the middle trees. They were in the bottom. What is the meaning of I saw at night? Someone answered and says, the Holy One, blessed be he sought to return to the entire world by night. And behold, a man riding refers to the Holy One of Israel riding his horse because he's a man of war. 
they had no problem here with the physical manifestation of God that we find in the Old Testament. Today they do. Not then. Especially medieval rabbis. Later, Kimki, known as the Radak. And also Ibn Ezra. Right? In, you know, in their commentary of Zachariah, they had no problem saying that this is a divine being. This is a head start for the whole book where we see right in the outset, in its outset, Yeshua in the midst of the nation, crying with Israel, suffering with them, and asking the Lord to look upon them. Here he is seen riding a red horse, not a white horse as the Antichrist does in Revelation chapter 6, to fool the world with a false peace. Yeshua is on a red horse, for he is ready to come as a warrior to save all his people. While the earth is resting quietly, we're going to see surely under the lies of the Antichrist, Yeshua is ready to come. And why were these angels going to and fro okay, throughout the earth? And what is wrong, by the way, with the earth being in peace and quiet? They're going to and fro to observe the nations and to see what they're doing. Right? The angel's complaint is, how could the world be at peace when Jerusalem is not at peace? This is why. We'll look at this actually next week. And what are, why, what are the middle trees in the visions? What do they represent? What about the ravine, the depth, and the horses? And why are the angels so angry as well? All these things we'll look into in our next studies. So what we find in the outset, at the start of the opening vision, is that God is very involved with what is happening in Israel today. With Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, with world politics. Yeshua is seen with his armies of angels on a red horse, ready to come down. Perhaps this is the image of Jesus we should proclaim, for many consider, still consider him as a baby in a manger. Christmas is almost gone. And this is who the world will meet, at least those who did not make him their personal savior. To close, we can remember God's first words to the people of Zacharias' time. Verse 2, the Lord has been angry with our fathers. A study of history shows that great civilization of the world have an average of about 200 years. And there's a timetable of, of people of the world, the people of the world have followed. The people come, go from slavery and then suddenly spiritual faith to courage, freedom, abundance, and then return back to selfishness, apathy, dependence, and slavery. And the circle starts again. It's a never-ending circle as man always reverts back to self-concern, self-centeredness, self-interest. We understand why the New Testament is filled with a command to love one another. Because it's against our nature, but the Spirit of God can help us. Let's bow ahead in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Lord and our King, we ask you now to give us all of your Ruach HaKodesh, all of your spirit, and to give it continually that we may awaken, enlighten, and encourage, and enable us to dare to take the small and large steps of moving out of the comfort with which we can comfort each other and into hope in you. Turn us away towards you. Do not allow us to hide from you. Do not let us do anything without you. Show us how glorious you are. How glorious it is to trust you and to obey. You are glorified. You who make us free in Yeshua Mashiach. You son by confessing and standing on this. That our hope is in you. B'Shem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen, amen. The congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, amen. May the Lord bless you all.